So All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think that you will find this story just as amazing as I did. Um, I would really like to give a warm welcome to our guest speaker this evening, Mr. Howard Ginsburg. He graduated from Emory. Oh, go ahead and clap. <laughs> Howard graduated from Emory Law School in 1975. Prior to that, Howard graduated from Cornell as an undergraduate in 1970. Um, and I'm mentioning that in particular because Cornell really does become the focus of his story and presentation today. Um, Howard tragically lost his son, who was an undergrad at Cornell at the time, in February of 2010. And he had spent his entire professional career doing commercial real estate work. But at that point in time, he filed a wrongful death suit against Cornell and the city of Ithaca. So that suit was filed in, 20, in November of 2011, and it really ended up changing the course of his career as well. Um, he learned as much as he could about litigation to really be present in the suit and then to come on as an attorney in the suit. So he has prepared some really, really interesting remarks for you today. I know we'll go in depth behind the scenes of everything that took place over the course of the suit, and we'll let you know about the resolution as well, but we're just really pleased to have it. So thank you so much, Howard. Thank you. I've been treated so well here, I don't think I'm going to leave. <laughs> so, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about Bradley to start off with. Um, Bradley exemplified everything you would want in the sun. Values of honor, goodness, humility, intelligence, academic excellence, hard work, exceptional focus, determination, and altruism towards others. Uh, Bradley was one of the strongest students at West Park High School. Uh, he graduated fourth in his class uh, with straight A's. Uh, he scored five on the final exam uh, for each of the 10 AP courses and was awarded the National AP Scholar of Distinction. He also was awarded the Boy State Award. At Cornell, Bradley achieved straight A's during the first semester. But Bradley would not want, us, want me to tell you this. For these things were not important to him. Bradley was extremely humble, modest, and non-materialistic who would not talk about any of his achievements or display any of his awards. Bradley had only positive things to say about others and was the most moral and ethical person I've ever known. Bradley is the best person I've ever known and is my role model. Whenever I am faced with difficult situations, I always say to myself, what would Bradley do? Even as a toddler and mommy and me, Bradley made a great impression on others my wife Sherry was working, and Bradley's nanny Susan took him to the Mommy and Me class. One day, Sherry, my wife, received a phone call from another mom. She said, you don't know me, but I know your son. He is the sweetest, kindest person I ever met. I have to meet his mom and dad. Bradley was hardly talking, but his goodness related to everyone. Bradley cared about his friends and others' achievements more than his own. Bradley always wanted to help anyone who needed help in high school and college. There were many nights that when he was doing his homework and would get a call from a classmate asking for help, he would drop his homework and go to the classmate. Bradley did it out of the goodness of his heart and never accepted any money. While at Cornell, Bradley worked approximately 10 hours each day, each week in the dining hall to earn spending money and refused to take any from us. Bradley sought knowledge for its own sake and not for any other reason. Bradley was a true leader. He never sought any leadership position. However, because he was always fair, intelligent, and so inspired others, that when a leadership position was necessary, others always wanted him to assume a leadership position. When Bradley rushed AD Pi fraternity, the first week of his second semester at Cornell, he touched the brothers' hearts so deeply that they offered him a bid several days before they were supposed to. He brought so much cheer and happiness to the fraternity that they nicknamed Bradley Smiles. Bradley had so many interests. He was an exceptional athlete and loved sports. He loved traveling and hiking, 
through all the national parks with us. He was an excellent poker player and very interested in business and the stock market. Bradley loved his sister Courtney so much, they were best friends as we all were. When we lost Bradley, there was a mortal room through my heart. I am still a state in a state of shock, as is my wife and daughter. There is no such thing as closure. Everything is as if it happened yesterday. Bradley is my guiding light, and I have best done my best to follow in his footsteps and ideals to do for others what Bradley always did. Shortly after we lost Bradley, I established a 501c3 tax deductible for public charity called the Bradley Mark Ginsburg Scholarship Foundation Corp. Every year, Bradley's foundation gives a college scholarship to the West Focus High student who best emulates Bradley's values and ideals. Each student awarded the scholarship has your name placed on a plaque honoring Bradley, which hangs in the May office of the high school. The scholarship, because of the great esteem that Bradley was held in at West Boca High, has become the most sought after award given at the high school. Now we'll get into why I sued. While there are a myriad of reasons that go into the decisions, there are a few things which pushed me over the top. While a Cornell alumni, I was not initially aware as to what transpired I, after I graduated with regard to jumping deaths at the gorge. While I was at Cornell, no one took their life at the gorge. And it was not spoken about much. The main issue on campus was the Vietnam War, and Cornell was one of the main hotspots of protest. However, after Bradley, two additional students jumped to the gorge within a four-week period. This became a major story for the press, and Cornell was being called Suicide U. Parents were frightened and kept calling Cornell. Sherry and I were on CNN twice. It was only at this time that Cornell reacted with a full court PR press. Cornell took out ads in newspapers telling the press students how important it was to seek help, started guarding all of the court site for 24 hours a day, stating that fencing needed to be installed at the board <coughs> sites, etc. I also, for the first time, learned that 28 students had taken their lives at the Gorges since 1990, and that no one had done anything to prevent this situation until now. Someone needed to be held accountable, and it was crucial to see that this never happened again. Bradley was the most even keel and rational person. He was never too high or too low. There were no cameras at the dormitory and none at the gorge. The only thing we had was an unsigned note found on Bradley's <coughs> own computer. We thought that he could have been kidnapped or that a fraternity prank had caused what happened. Certainly, we never thought that Bradley would have taken his own life. I asked the uni university if they could have a forensic analysis done on his computer and they agreed. They told me the results of the analysis would be completed within a three-week period. I did not receive the report until approximately eight weeks after it was initiated. However, the report was dated several weeks before Cornell gave me a copy. After reviewing the report, I knew what had happened. I was very upset that Cornell had held on to the report for several weeks before sending me a copy. The Cornell had some dining and the students who worked there with Bradley thought so much of him that they wanted to name an award in his honor and give the award each year to the student in dining who exemplified Bradley's service, dedication, hard work, and values. They created a beautiful plaque and it was to be to hang in the North Star Freshman Dining Hall where all the freshmen ate all their meals. Each year, the winner of the award would have a name placed on the plaque. Cornell refused to allow this and instead, after much heated contacts with me, agreed to allow a one-time award, and it was hung in the office of the heads of dining, together with a beautiful photo montage of Bradley that dining had put together on a plaque. Dining was kind enough to send us copies of both the award plaque and a photo montage. I hated working with what I felt was an unfeeling bureaucracy, which after a while seemed to push everything under the carpet, and move on pretending like nothing had happened. 
Uh, here are some student suicide statistics. Over 50% of all college students will suffer from depression. Major studies, one of them being Cornell, and these studies encompass about 50,000 students, show that at any point in time, between 15 to 18 percent of all college students are seriously thinking of taking their lives. It's an unbelievable statistic. Approximately 5 to 7 percent of these students will attempt to take their lives. Until the age of approximately 23, the frontal lobe of the brain is not fully developed. The frontal lobe of the brain is what exercises rationality to overcome emotions. At Cornell, 50% of the student deaths were by, by suicide or by jumping, versus 2% nationwide. Most of, student suicide, most of suicide is impulsive. If one attempting suicide is stopped, then studies indicate that 90% of these people will never attempt it again. It is a misconception that suicide is always planned. Then I went searching for an attorney, which was almost impossible. While an attorney and member of the New York State Bar and the Federal Court, Southern and Eastern Districts, I had not practiced law in 30 years and had never had anything to do with litigation. I did not know a summons from a complaint, from zero about discovery, and nothing about motion practice or trial. For me, the rules, federal rules of civil procedure might as well have been written in Latin. When I, what I did know was being a commercial real estate entrepreneur for 30 years who started in business with no money and no knowledge about commercial real estate. I learned all aspects of commercial real estate by being in the game, never being up, being persistent, etc. After 30 years, I became an expert at making presentations, negotiations, reading people by either watching their body language or listening to their voice inflections on the phone, closing deals, strategy, and how to sell. I was involved with contracts this entire time, so reviewing and writing contracts became an expertise of mine. In any endeavor I undertook, I was always very hands-on. I told myself that I, if I were to accomplish this, then I could use these skills and learn litigation on the run if I totally focused and applied myself. When you've worked and gone against the best in the most tense and dramatic circumstances, and you're used to dealing in what might be called the World Series of Life. Common sense told me that if I filed suit in the New York State courts, I didn't have a chance as Cornell was a 5,000 pound elephant in the upstate New York area. What I did know from my civil procedure days at Emory with Professor Sir Ferguson was that I could sue in the New York State federal courts as we had diversity of citizenship New York State law was what would go. I spent month after month looking for an attorney in New York State to represent me, but nobody would take my case on a contingency basis. Why attorneys refused to take the case? I was told that the most important of the monetary damages in a wrongful death case, the pain and suffering of the survivors, were not allowed under New York State law in a case such as ours. Most importantly, I was advised by the attorneys that I spoke with that all the legal precedents went against Bradley and I. I was told that Cornell did not own the Thurston Avenue Bridge where the situation with Bradley occurred, the city of Ithaca. Therefore, how could Cornell have any liability for a bridge they did not own and therefore was not a tort fee? Additionally, the bridge met all New York State, federal, and municipal guidelines and won numerous awards. The general rule on liability for suicide is that suicide is an unforeseeable intervening cause of death which absolves the tort fees of liability. In other words, suicide is a superseding act that breaks nearly any causal chain. The legal duties of colleges to prevent suicide were sharply limited. The only exception and only possibility at the time of my case to hold the university or anyone else liable would be the university needed to have a special relationship with the student who took their life to create a legal duty to prevent suicide. The question asked with regard to the above was, did the university have notice of the student's suicide fatality or was the specific student's 
suicide otherwise foreseeable. There were just a few state cases that ruled in favor, all over the country, that ruled in favor of this exception, and they were narrowly drawn. Our case was as far as possible from this exception. Bradley was getting straight A's at Cornell. He had joined the fraternity, and the Bradley brothers, as I've said, called Bradley Smiles because of his great magical smile. Bradley had never been treated for depression or any other mental health issues. As far as we or anyone else knew, Bradley was doing great. Therefore, I was told by every law firm I spoke with was that the facts in our case did not have one chance in a thousand of succeeding. Additionally, under the law, remedial actions taken after the facts were not admissible. As far as the city of Ithaca was concerned, everyone knew about the immunity that municipalities had. Additionally, I was advised that even if it got to a jury, the juries in upstate New York were conservative, and that it would be difficult to defend against contributory negligence. In effect, all the attorneys and law firms I spoke with told me, thank you, but you have no chance, so don't waste our time or yours. The above was amended were amongst the many arguments made by Cornell and the city of Ithaca in their motion to dismiss and motion for summary judgment. I continually searched the web for a wrongful death attorney and kept calling until I saw a wrongful death blog by attorney Lee Williams of Rochester, New York. I called him and spoke to him and immediately cut a contingency fee deal with him whereby he would also pay all expenses of the lawsuit. Now I had an attorney. We did not want to enter into any lawsuit, and therefore we wrote Cornell's counsel several letters asking for a meeting. We were refused each time, and finally told by Cornell counsel that we had no case, and if we brought what Cornell called a frivolous lawsuit, then Cornell would sue for damages. I told Lee we should proceed with the lawsuit against Cornell. He said, well, the city of Ithaca owns the Thurston Avenue Bridge, so we should sue them also. We therefore decided to sue both Cornell and the city of Ithaca. One of the most important things with regard to the lawsuit was that both Bradley and my name were bound together as plaintiffs. Howard Ginsburg is administrator of the estate of Bradley and Mark Ginsburg plaintiffs versus the city of Ithaca and Cornell University defendants. Our lawsuit set many precedents, and now Bradley and I are forever together in one of the most important mental health cases ever involving institutions of higher learning and their responsibilities. The lawsuit strategy. I knew we couldn't play the normal legal game. Our team consisted of me, someone who had not practiced law for 30 years and knew nothing about litigation, and Lee Williams, who I later found out had never litigated in the federal courts. <laughs> <laughs> we were David without a slingshot and would be going up against a 10,000 pound Goliath consisting of some of the best attorneys in the country, over approximately 400 when taking into account the large prestigious law firms representing both Cornell and the city. It was like a handful of unarmed villagers without weapons being attacked by Genghis Khan and all his warriors. Bradley and I were big fans of Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell and had read all of his books. His book, David and Goliath, made a big impression on me. In chapter 2, I even cite the pages, pages 21 and 22, <laughs> the author states, what happens in wars between the strong and the weak, side does as David does and refuses to fight the way the bigger side wants to fight using unconventional or guerrilla tactics. The answer in those cases, I'm still pointing out the The answer in those cases, the weaker party's winning percentage climbs from 28.5% to 63.6%. I decided that in order to have a chance of winning, we needed to become like Che or Ho Chi Minh and use unorthodox guerrilla tactics. <laughs> I'm a history buff, so I also thought that the Nixon madman theory would come in handy. <laughs> Not only would we fight the group battle in the courtroom, but also in the court of public opinion. I would do what I could to go after Cornell's reputation via the press. I would bend over backwards to help the press get the important facts out 
and fill them in and send them any background information they wanted. On the other hand, Goliath would not talk to the press. And after the lawsuit started, Goliath simply told them they expected the case to be dismissed quickly. Therefore, the press would report our story in the way we knew it should be reported, since we bent over backwards to help them, and we were the only ones giving them any information. I knew that it would be very difficult to, for us to prove damages under New York State law. Therefore, part of our strategy was directed to do whatever we could to harm the reputations of both the city and Cornell. I knew that there would be alumni, trustees, etc., who would be watching our case, who could put pressure on Cornell to settle. I said to him, with regard to Cornell, if we just sue the university, then they won't even notice who care about the lawsuit. We should also sue individuals who are responsible for university policy to bring the lawsuit home to them so that it really mattered, get them, hit them individually. We therefore also sued David Scorton, president of Cornell, Susan Murphy, his right-hand person who ran just about everything at Cornell, and the two heads of psychology at Cornell Gannett Health Clinic. As regards the amount of, amount of money to sue for, we said 50,000, which I believe is a minimum. I said, no, we need to sue for millions to get everyone's attention, including the media. I picked the 12, $12 million dollar number, but with the 14 different causes of action, this became approximately $150 million. And when the lawsuit was filed, this was one of the main headlines. Our lawsuit was basically a mission for me, and not like a job for everyone else. Talk about the judge, who really is a hero in this case. District Judge David Hurd was appointed the judge for our case. I researched everything I could about Judge Hurd ascertained that he was the most liberal and plaintiff-friendly judge in the Northern District of New York State. If there was a hero on our case, it was to be Judge Hurd. Many of the other, other judges appeared to be good old country club Republican types who I thought would have dismissed our case the first opportunity they got. I also read that Judge Hurd was a Cornell graduate of the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, as I was that Judge Hurd had served as a moot court judge at Cornell and had donated to Cornell. I decided to do something that was totally counterintuitive. I told Lee that we needed to make a motion to accuse Judge Hurd. We said that this was the wrong thing to do and would anger Judge Hurd. I said, thank you and let's make a motion. <laughs> I knew that Judge Hurd would not recuse himself. But I wanted to get all the Cornell contacts of Judge Hurd out in the open and mostly wanted to show Cornell that if I was crazy enough to make the motion for recusal, then I could do anything, so beware and don't try and bully me. <laughs> Judge Hurd, I expected, did not recuse himself. But in his decision, he said that, yes, I am a Cornell graduate, served as a Cornell Moon Court judge, and had donated to Cornell. However, he said that with that being said, I will be fair. And by him saying, I will be fair, meant a lot to me because it showed he had a heart, a real heart, because most of them would not have said that. Judge Hearn did not have to make the statement. It said a lot about him, and he became one of my heroes. It was obvious that Judge Hearn was one of those people who had a big heart. Initial research for our case. The main theory of our case was that there had been 28 deaths by jumping at Gorge Bridges between 1992 and 2010, but neither the city nor Cornell cared enough to do anything about it by using means restrictions such as fencing, netting under the bridges, etc., to prevent deaths by jumping because they did not want to ruin the viewpoints of the gorge from the bridge. And that's what we also learned in discovery. Our focus was on the Thurston Avenue Bridge, which was the one involving Bradley. However, when discussing death by jumping from the Seven Gorge Bridges on the campus, we tied them all together as one and so the judge heard. The time span that we focused on was when the Thurston Avenue Bridge was reconstructed in 2006-2007. 
Talks between the city and Cornell about the reconstruction went back about 10 years before that. The reconstruction is when means restriction to prevent jumping from gorge bridges should have been put on the bridges. We found an article which indicated that the Cornell Board of Trustees voted to approve the reconstruction. If Cornell did not own the bridge and had nothing to do with, do with it, then why did they, the Board of Trustees of Cornell vote to approve the bridge reconstruction? And why did Cornell and the city have meetings going back about 10 years prior to the reconstruction of the bridge? This was the beginning of our theory that while Ithaca and not Cornell owned the bridge, Cornell had effective control over it and therefore should be held accountable for deaths from the board's bridges. We also argued that while remedial actions after the fact were not admissible, which was the law all over the country, we should be able to have discovery about the remedial actions and bring them into our case as evidence to show effective control of the bridge by Cornell. The judge adopted this, and it was written up, up by Skadden Office in the New York Law Journal, and it was on page one of the litigation uh, section of the Law Journal. Additionally, after the Thurston Avenue Bridge's reconstruction, in which it was claimed that the railing had been raised as a means restriction, we found a crucial photo showing a Cornell employee standing on an 18-inch cement parapet at the bottom of the railings, which was not present prior to the redesign of the bridge, whereby one could clearly see that the effective height of the railings was actually lower than before the reconstruction, and Judge Heard mentioned this in his decision. While the city owned several of the seven gorge bridges, including the Thurston Avenue Bridge, and Cornell the rest, anyone you spoke to would say that Cornell owned all the campus bridges. In fact, on numerous occasions, Cornell referred to and acted with regard to the bridges as if they owned them. We were well aware of the previous case history involving the need for a special relationship between the university and the person taking their life. However, I had a new theory. I said that the gorge bridges can be equated to leaving a loaded shotgun or a handgun on a dining room table in the campus dining room with thousands of students made each day. No one knows who will pick up the gun and start firing at others. However, over, over time, if the gun is continually left on the table, someone will. Thus, we argued that the special relationship was irrelevant. Instead, since the Gorge Bridges had 29 jumping deaths within a 20 year period, that what was relevant that someone would jump and that it was obligation of Cornell and the city to take steps such as means restriction to prevent sin. In other words, it was foreseeable that someone would jump from the bridge in the future. This became um, arguments which we tied to premises liability. As the lawsuit proceeded, I learned that Lee had never litigated in the federal courts. For, in, for example, when Lee drafted the complaint, there were no facts in it. As Lee said, that the bill of particulars would include the facts. I found out that bills of particular are not used in the federal court. Instead, they were used in the New York State courts. Upon receiving Cornell's answer and motion to dismiss, which specifically said that we had no facts to back up our statements in the complaint, I became much more involved in the case and drafted an amended complaint with all the facts included. The case was now my main focus. We filed our responses to the defendant's motion to dismiss. Judge Hurd in his decision dropped all the individual defendants from the case. Judge Hurd ruled in our favor based upon premises liability and its historical decision, accepting our arguments, and we established newly set precedents in several areas. Of primary importance, no one did the victim have to have a special relationship with the defendant. The law of premises liability would now be able to be used to define liability. Judge Hurd's decision was entirely based upon premises liability. Judge Hurd stated, foreseeability, the possibility, and I'm quoting, 
that Bradley in particular would commit suicide is irrelevant. It was clearly foreseeable that someone on the line may commit suicide by jumping off the first of the bridge. In short, the history of suicide and suicide attempts, defendant's public acknowledgement of the phenomenon, and the bridge's acceptability to a student population, 15% of which regularly considers suicide, shows defendants had actual or constructive knowledge that a suicide attempt from the bridge was foreseeable. As owner and control of the Thurston Avenue Bridge, defendants had a duty to maintain that property in a reasonable, safe condition to prevent foreseeable suicides and of course. Judge heard the statement with regard in the decision extensive control. It is undisputed that Cornell, that Ithaca, not Cornell, owns the Thurston Avenue Bridge. And said Ginsburg alleges that Cornell has extensive control over the operation of the bridge, held it out as its own, and interacted with the architects, engineers, and contractors to finalize the redesign plans and oversee the reconstruction of the bridge in 2006-2007. The amended complaint also references a recent article indicating that current redesigns of area bridges will be submitted to both Cornell trustees and the city for approval. For purposes of this motion, plaintiff's assertion that Cornell and Ithaca jointly controlled and maintained the bridge is accepted as true. The decision created an exception to allow plaintiffs to introduce remedial actions into evidence to show effective control. Judge continued, defendants argue that the neg negligence case must be dismissed because they had fulfilled the duty of installing adequate safeguards on the bridge when the Thurston Avenue Bridge was reconstructed in 2006-07 after a thorough safety study and in compliance with all federal standards. Judge continues, clearly the redesign and reconstruction did not prevent Bradley from jumping off the bridge. The judge continued, Defendants maintain that Bradley's affirmative act of jumping from the bridge was an intervening, superseding act that cut off all liability on their part. However, when the intervening act is itself the foreseeable harm that shapes the duty imposed, the defendant who fails to guard against such conduct will not be relieved of liability when the act occurs. We then started discovery since we had not had our horses dismissed. Shortly after discovery commenced, I applied for and was admitted to practice law in the Federal District Court, Northern District of New York State. This was so that I could become co-counsel on our case and would now be treated as a lead counsel. At our first discovery meeting with Magistrate Judge David Peoples, Cornell attempted to remove me as co-counsel. I have no idea why. I stated that I be my own counsel if I was suing pro se, and that therefore was no difference if I served as co-counsel. I was not removed as co-counsel. Cornell was lucky that it did not succeed, as the most they most probably would not have been able to settle the case as we did had I been removed. Judge Peoples was a gentleman and a very nice guy. However, he reminded me of a country club Republican. However, he was on our case simply to referee discovery, and he had to carry out Judge Hurd's decisions, even though he indicated that Judge Hurd's decisions were way outside the mainstream. As discovery was starting, it became clear that another attorney with much more federal court knowledge would be needed the rest of the way. Now that we had won the first motion, it would be easier to retain a more experienced attorney, so Lee was replaced by Ken McCallion. Ken was an exceptional litigator who had previously been an assistant U.S. attorney and deputy attorney general of New York State prior to going into private practice. Ken also signed a contingency agreement with me and agreed to pay for all expenses incurred. I told Ken that I would do all the backup work needed for depositions, memos of law, working with experts, etc. I spent over a thousand hours on the case and totally neglected my business. I 
and was only able to work with regard to my business when we had interruptions in the case, like right before discovery started and after the motion uh, to dismiss was not, uh, was not uh, accepted by Judge Hurd. As I saw it, uh, uh, oh, as, as time went on, my thoughts were that Ken was spread very thin with minimal backup and a heavy caseload. As I saw it, a main responsibility of mine was to get Ken to focus on our case. The city of Ithaca played straight with us and gave us whatever discovery we requested. Cornell was far different, attempting to keep as much information from us as possible. For example, when we asked for all the documents having anything to do with the bridge railings, Cornell document dumped several thousand documents on us, and probably less than 5% having to do with information as to what we requested. Luckily, we had the city of Ithaca as a defendant, and we got much of the information that Cornell could not find from the city. <laughs> Cornell forced us to make motion after motion to assert, obtain certain documents, which they said were not relevant, and we won all the motions. Of course, this was part of the game plan, to force us to spend much time and effort to obtain information and documents which they should have given us. I called the stonewalling and said so to the judges and press. I had to be more careful what I said to the press when I became co-counsel than when I was just a defendant. The more outrageous the statements one makes, the more the press you get. And getting caught out as bad a press as possible was an important part of our strategy. We ended up getting the information and documents we needed. In real estate purchases and business dealings, failing to give the buyer the appropriate due diligence is called fraud. In litigation, it appeared that this was part of the course. Fortunately, with regard to the depositions, both defendants cooperated fully with us. You never know what someone will say in a deposition, no matter how rehearsed they are. You can take thousands of pages of depositions, and out of these pages, there can only be a few lines which are cru crucial and help make your case. One never knows. The experts. Mostly they're expensive, expensive prostitutes who will recommend <laughs> 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 will testify to exactly what the plaintiff or defendant wants him to write and say. The fees are anywhere from approximately $300 an hour to $1,000 an hour. The expert is obtained by the attorney. You can either go, as I'm worried, to a company that represents experts in a specific field. Let's call them agents. The fees that <laughs> one uses an agent are higher as you have a middleman who tax their fee on top of the fee of the expert. The client pays the agent, who then pays the expert. At times, the agent is paid by the client and then stiffs the expert. This happened to one of our experts who we obtained via an agent. He said that his agent had just stiffed him, that's what he said, on a fee that he was owed and told us to forget about the agent and pay him directly. Obviously, it is less expensive to obtain an expert without an agent, and it's easier to negotiate a further reduction in the fee. Does the attorney review the expert's report, offer suggestions for additions, subtractions, and changes to the report? Of course. Will at times an attorney actually write most of the expert's report, give it to the expert for review and signature? What do you think? <laughs> Both us and the defendant had both psychiatric and bridge engineering experts. To prove damages, we retained a, return, a renowned damages expert who I found via Google. What struck me the most about this expert was his company's creed, which stated, and I quote, you must be satisfied with the quality of our services, in brackets, independent of the outcome of your case, or you do not owe us a fee. If there is a question or concern in this regard, please contact with us within 30 days of the receipt of our invoice. We will make every effort to meet your expectations and resolve any issues. 
our expectations were certainly fulfilled. New York State law does not allow the survivors to sue for pain and suffering. The damages were pecuniary, but since Bradley was a student and did not have any real record of income, such as a person who had had a job, worked for 25 years with a substantial income. Therefore, all the experts' assumptions and our damages were totally speculative. To greatly simplify, damages will flow to us only on the assumption that Bradley was making a very high income and that we were virtually bankrupt and needed Bradley to support us. Otherwise, we would get no damages. We needed something to take the damage issue to the jury, and this was it, something to hang our hat on. To be awarded damages, a jury would need to base a damages decision in our favor on the above assumptions. The above damages report would thus give the jury something, as I said, to hang its hat on, to award damages, even though they, would te they technically thought the assumptions too speculative. In other words, if, if the jury thought the damages or just a lot of BS, um, they could, would award them anyway, and you know that would be that. They needed something, we thought they needed something to hang their head on, and that was the best we could do. Fast track. As I mentioned before, my retainer with Attorney McCallion was based upon a one-third contingency fee and his payment of all expenses. Towards the end of discovery, he sent me and asked me to sign loan documents from a company called Fast Track, whereby he would receive a $25,000 loan to cover trial expenses. The interest rate on the loan was approximately 300 to 400% compounded annually. The amounts owed on this loan after six months would be $48,000, after 18 months, $78,000. After two years, 99,000, and after two and a half years, 125,000. The 25,000 did not have to be escrow to be used solely for my case, and Fast Track would have the first liens again lean against the proceeds of the plaintiff's recovery. Attorney's fees will be paid in full. Part of the documents was a list of 14 cases that the attorney had borrowed money on. All the cases were course collateralized with each other. If there was no settlement in the case, then the attorney would owe the loan plus all the compounded interest, which would be paid off when another of his cases was settled. The above documents with Fast Track caused me to worry whether the attorney had enough money to pay trial expenses. Additionally, the fact that he had done this approximately 14 times with other cases indicated to me that when he signed the retainer with the estate to pay all the expenses of our case, that he probably knew he would need to borrow money once again in a similar fashion from Fast Track. I regarded the above as a huge conflict of interest with regard to the attorney and his client. I was amazed that something such as this was even legal. I would not sign the document. Motions for summary judgment. <clears throat> Cornell and the city's motions for summary judgment were similar to their prior motion to dismiss. I spent every day for a month reviewing thousands of pages of documents, depositions, etc., and wrote our preliminary factual response to the defendant's, defendant's motion for summary judgment. Ken McCallion took my response and wrote the final response, including the memo of law, which was an amazing piece of writing. Judge Hurd's decision. Judge Hurd ruled the following. Initial material fact remains for the jury as to whether Cornell exercised sufficient control over the design, construction, and maintenance of the Thurston Avenue Bridge to justify holding it liable with Ithaca for injuries caused by alleged hazards on the bridge. It is undisputed that Bradley's particular suicide was unforeseeable However, the foresee of Bradley's suicide is irrelevant. The issue is instead whether a suicide attempt from the Thurston Avenue Bridge was likely to recur and was foreseeable. If so, it must then be determined whether the defendants had the opportunity and took reasonable measures to prevent such an impulsive suicide attempt by anyone. 
In light of the documented history of suicides on the Cornell's campus, especially those involving the bridges and gorges, a reasonable juror could conclude that further suicide attempts on Thurston Avenue Bridge were likely to occur and more foreseeable. The City of Ithaca Immunity Issue. Judge states, although various people testified that the sub subject of suicide prevention was generally discussed at design meetings, there is nothing in the record indicating Ithaca performed any pre-construction study of this particular subject. As no formal study of means restriction was ever completed or considered despite the available evidence and extensive opportunities to do so during the years of the reconstruction project, there and thereafter, Ithaca is not entitled to immunity. Whether the reconstructed, quoting the judge again, whether the reconstructed Thurston Avenue Bridge was reasonably, reasonably safe in light of the alleged foreseeable risk of future suicide attempts is a factual issue to be determined by the jury. Each of the above decisions was precedent setting. <clears throat> Talk about damages. All damages, except for pecuniary damages, were dismissed by Judge Hurd in his decisions. With regard to the motion to dismiss and for summary judges, judgment and motions in limine. When I had the great pleasure of speaking at Emory University Law School on October 26, 2015, with regard to the landmark case, Ginsburg versus the City of Ithaca and Cornell University, the video and audio stopped working and 25% of my speech was not recorded. Therefore, I'm doing a video and audio for the remainder of my talk today, January 14th, 2016, which happens to be my 29th birthday. My talk is being recorded at the elementary school in Boca Raton, where my wife teaches. And I will start today's talk at the topic, which is damages, which is exactly where the video at Emory stopped. All damages except for pecuniary damages were dismissed by Judge Hurd in his decisions with regard to the motions to dismiss, motions for summary ju judgment, and motions in limine. The pecuniary damages, I have, as I have previously discussed, were highly speculative and would only come into play under specific circumstances. I knew that even if a jury awarded damages, Judge Hurd could reduce them to whatever amount he decided. Settlement discussions. Judge Hurd postponed the trial twice. One of the times my wife and I flew into Albany the day before the trial was to start, and as I was stepping off the plane, I received a call from Judge Hurd's law clerk telling me that the trial was postponed for several weeks. It was a known fact that Judge Hurd wanted the case settled and did not want to try the case. At the same time, I was very nervous about my attorney's preparation for the trial. At the initial settlement conference held in Judge Hurd's chamber, I was unable to attend and I was represented by Attorney McCallion. With regard to, Judge Her uh, with regard to Cornell, Judge Hurd strongly recommended a scholarship in Bradley's honor in perpetuity which value would go strictly to the student receiving the scholarship. With regard to the city, Judge Hurd proposed a $250,000 cash payment to the estate. The only monetary component of the settlement was $250,000. Ken McCallion presented Judge Hurd's proposals to me. As a result of the above settlement conference, the court set a schedule directing the defendants to convey offers by August 22, 2014, and directly for the plaintiff to respond by September 8, 2014. Trial was reset for September 29, 2014. Now I'll discuss the settlement offers, offers and response. Cornell's settlement offer was a scholarship in perpetuity in Bradley's honor. The city offered 75000 on August 25th, 2014, Attorney McCallion sent me a proposed letter for my review, 
which stated that we would accept Judge Heard's settlement in its entirety. I did not care who paid the two fifty, but there was no deal without the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar cash payment, and this was stated in uh, the proposed letter. On August twenty sixth, I received an email from Attorney McCallion stating that he would not sign onto any settlement without a change in the retainer agreement so that all of Judge Hurd's recommended $250,000 monetary settlement proceeds were paid to him as attorney's fees. I was shocked by this email and rejected Attorney McCallion's request out of hand and told him that I, as co-counsel, would send out our response letter with regard to the defendant's offers in the same form as his letter, except I stated in the letter that plaintiff acting as co-counsel is in charge of settlement negotiations for the plaintiff. In a further email to me, Attorney McCallion stated that the Cornell, that the value of the Cornell settlement scholarship had to be monetized and that if accepted, he was entitled to be paid in dollars his portion of the monetized amount. He valued the monetary amount of the Cornell scholarship at approximately a million six, and he stated that if the Cornell scholarship had no monetary value, that I should not pursue any settlement with Cornell and go to trial. It was obvious that a huge conflict of interest now existed between Attorney McCallion and the estate. Uh, the next topic is Judge Heard excludes Attorney McCallion from the telephonic settlement negotiations. Judge Heard scheduled s separate telephonic settlement conferences with each defendant. He excluded Attorney McCallion from each settlement conference. This exclusion spoke louder than words. <clears throat> In the Cornell telephonic settlement discussion held on September 8, 2014, Judge Heard pushed very hard that I accept the Cornell scholarship offer. He stated that the Cornell scholarship <coughs> would honor Bradley, that the defendants had numerous defenses they would argue, including contributory negligence on Bradley's part, <coughs> that there was a strong chance that the case would be lost in front of a conservative jury in upstate New York, and that both the Cornell scholarship and any monetary award from the city could be lost. He also stated that Cornell had always stated that they would not agree to any monetary award and the defendants, both defendants, had always stated that they would appeal any adverse verdict to the Second Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals, which everyone knows is basically a, a uh, very conservative uh, uh, country club Republican type of court. Uh, which is basically uh, called the uh, Wall Street Protection Court. I was worried that the Second Circuit would overturn the important precedents set in our case if an appeal was made and the Second Circuit could also reduce or disallow any damages awarded. In fact, the city had appealed Judge Hurd's decision with regard to not allowing immunity on their part, but the Second Circuit ruled that the appeal was too early. I also knew that an appeal could go on for years and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and that my retainer did not include any appeals. The settlement conference ended at 3 p.m. and Judge Heard gave me until 5 p.m. that day to accept Cornell scholarship offer or go to trial. I told just Judge Heard that the devil was in the details and that I wanted to discuss the details of the scholarship with Cornell prior to making any decision. Judge Heard replied that I had until 5 p.m. today to call Cornell and accept the scholarship or the offer was off the table and we would go to trial. I knew that accepting the settlement without any details agreed upon would mean that I had very little negotiating power. However, Judge Heard had brought me to the dance and now was telling me that I should fold my cards with Cornell and take the settlement. Judge Heard had eliminated all but speculative pecuniary damages. My thoughts were that I was being told that the dance had ended, 
and it was time to go home. As the saying goes, you go home with the person that took you to the dance. After playing poker with less than a pair of twos and winning every hand, it was time to fold my cards against Cornell. I sent an email to attorney McCallion that I would accept Cornell's offer. I then called Cornell and accepted the offer and sent an email to them stating so. Cornell had made this settlement offer in the past with no details about it. I had previously not accepted it as it was something my wife and I would have no control over. Instead, I had always wanted to obtain the largest settlement possible and donate every cent to Bradley's 501c3 Scholarship Foundation. I then had further discussions with Cornell about the details of the settlement. This is after, of course, accepting the settlement. The huge administrative Cornell bureaucracy was eliminated, and all points of the settlement were sent to the Cornell President's Office for approval. The name of the scholarship in Bradley's honor was agreed upon as the Brad Ginsburg 13 Memorial Scholarship, Cornell University. I insisted that another award be given in Bradley's honor to reinstate the award that the heads of dining and the students working there previously wanted to create in Bradley's honor, which had previously been rejected by Cornell. This award was now approved by Cornell, and the award is called the Brad Ginsburg 13 Award for Outstanding Student Service at Cornell University. It is awarded each year to the student working in Cornell Dining who most exemplifies Brad's hard work, service, teamwork, and values. We agreed that the plaques would be hung in the North Store Freshman Dining Hall. This is the first time in the history of Cornell that similar plaques were allowed to be hung in any Cornell building. After the stipulation was signed and filed, I worked with Cornell on the size of the plaques, of the two plaques, which are 16 inches by 20 inches. Cornell agreed to hang the two plaques side by side in the window next to the main entrance door, with the face of the plaques being able to be seen from both inside of the dining hall and through the window from the outside. The city then raised its offer to 100000 Judge Hurd would set no time constraint with regard to the city. The city's telephonic conference was set for a few days after the Cornell conference. The city's insurance was travelers, and they were paying for the attorneys, etc. In the interim, I spoke to the partner in charge for the city. He stated that the city did not want to settle for any amount and wanted to go to trial, but that the insurance company would settle for the approximate amount for what it would cost him to litigate, which was 75000 But he had gotten the authorization to go up to 100000 and that was final. After speaking with the city's attorney, I sent an email and spoke to attorney McCallion indicating my willingness to negotiate a revision of his retainer agreement. I offered to increase the, his part of the settlement proceeds to 50% with regard to continuing the lawsuit against the city. In return, I asked him to revise two parts of his retainer. The first part was that the estate would not be liable for any expenses incurred by him with regard to the case. The second part was that he handle any appeal as part of the contingency fee agreement, indicating that if I did not hear from him, I would accept the city's offer of $100,000. The estate had legal obligations to pay the expenses of the case. At this time, the expenses for the estate totaled approximately $75,000, almost all owed to attorney McCallion. The estate currently would be able to pay these expenses if it accepted the city's $100,000 settlement offer. Attorney McCallion would be incurring the remainder of the expenses for the trial, which could add an additional $25,000 plus in expenses. Additionally, there would be an appeal to the second, by the city to the Second Circuit, and the estate did not have the funds to pay for the appeal. Attorney McCallion refused to make the requested changes to the retainer 
In a subsequent discussion with Attorney McCallion, it was clear that we could not agree with respect to any settlement because of his demand that any monetary recovery go to him for his fees. On September 10th, 2014, Attorney McCallion wrote a letter to Judge Hurd, which is part of the case file, objecting that Judge Hurd had excluded him from the settlement conferences and asserting that for purposes of the settlement negotiations, he was acting as plaintiff's counsel. The meaning of this letter was clear, that without McCallion being involved in the settlement discussion, that I as administrator was not able to properly settle the case. My thoughts were that he would attempt to overturn the Cornell settlement that Judge Hurd had strongly recommended. My immediate response due to all of the above circumstances was to send an email to Judge Hurd's law clerk stating that because of Attorney McCallion's actions and conflicts of interest, I could no longer work with him and thereby accepted the city's $100,000 offer and discharged Attorney McCallion as my attorney. Judge Hurd immediately published my email on the court's ECF system and ended the case. That's it. After the settlement with Cornell and after the time I started working with Cornell, Cornell and I worked very exceptionally on with regard to the scholarship and the plaques and I became very much allied with them. Uh, the Cornell Daily Sun wrote a beautiful article, a editorial article, uh, which was uh, published by the Cornell Daily Sun on September 17, 2014. And the editorial is entitled, A Scholarship of Support. After years of litigation, and I quote, after years of litigation, a settlement was reached last week between the university and the father of a student who jumped to his death from the Thurston Avenue Bridge in 2010. Filed by Howard Ginsburg, 70, the lawsuit claimed that the university and the city of Ithaca did not do enough to prevent his son's death. As part of the settlement, an annual scholarship will be awarded to Cornelians in honor of Bradley Ginsburg, 13. We at The Sun believe that this settlement between Howard Ginsburg and Cornell is a positive memorial to Brad Ginsburg and his family, as well as a generous way to give back to the Cornell community. Since Bradley Ginsburg's suicide, along with the two others that occurred in the spring semester of 2010, Cornell has taken major steps to prevent future suicide attempts. During spring break of that year, the fences were erected on the bridges with construction on the current permanent net system beginning in 2012. We applaud the university for taking the necessary steps to try and mitigate the problem with physical improvements following the string of tragedies that took place. However, we believe that the lawsuit goes beyond physical changes needed on campus and extends to the mental health of all students. Though Howard Ginsburg argued that the university did not take enough precautionary measures to prevent his son's suicide, since 2010, Cornell has taken great measures to improve its mental health programming. In 2011, over $1 million was donated to Gannett Health Services, geared towards alleviating, area, alleviating stress, anxiety, and other serious mental health issues. In addition, programs like Cornell Minds Matter, an organization that aims to help those suffering from mental illnesses, encourage balanced lifestyles, and foster open lines of communication for the entire Cornell community. This extends to initiatives like counseling and psychological services, and Let's Talk, which both provide additional confidential services to those who are struggling and need a resource. University staff members have been trained to identify and aid students with mental health problems through the Notice and Respond program. We at the Sun believe that these necessary, that to these necessary programs, the scholarship shows that Cornell's additional dedication to his students in light of this tragedy. 
We believe that the scholarship was an appropriate measure taken into settling the lawsuit. The scholarship not only promotes higher education, but also serves as a reminder of the importance of a balanced lifestyle. Lastly, the scholarship is a tribute to Bradley Ginsburg. We encourage the Cornell community to communicate and seek help in times of stress, anxiety, and uncertainty. So the question is that people, was the thousand plus hours, horrendous hours, mentally and physically, that I spent on this case worth every minute? My answer is you bet it was. The photo uh, that's being shown now is are the two plaques, uh, two of the Brad, uh, Bradley's uh, plaques. One is the uh, plaque in honor of the uh, scholarship, and the second is in honor of the uh, service award given to the person in dining who best exemplifies uh, Bradley's uh, values and goodness. Um, the plaques are hanging, as I've stated in my talk, uh, at the front entrance to the dining hall. Uh, the the uh, North Star uh, Freshman Dining Hall. And every student who enters and leaves the dining hall sees these plaques, which is a terrific tribute uh, to Bradley. Um, Both the, uh, the plaques, the face of the plaque is on each side, so one entering the dining hall sees the plaque and one leaving the dining hall sees the plaques. Uh, again, uh, this is a, a great honor and tribute to Bradley and um, every, every minute I spent on the lawsuit with Bradley was worth it. This is a photo of Bradley's plaques hanging in the North Star Dining Hall from outside the dining hall.